Twitch, Amazon's live streaming esports platform, was hacked recently. Twitch has said that this was the result of an error in a change to a server configuration. This happened in the same week as the massive Facebook outage, also caused by an error in a change to a server configuration. Even though these sound similar, this is a very different kind of problem. Inevitably, sensibly even, detailed information on the specifics of data breaches like this tend to be hard to find. After all, if it wasn't, it would make things easier for the people that want to carry out attacks on our systems. So what can we learn from this data loss and what kinds of things can we do to at least limit if not prevent them? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. And if you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsors, Harness, Equal Experts, Octopus, and Specflow. Their links are in the description below, so please do check them out. My new book, Modern Software Engineering, explores what engineering ought to mean in the context of software development. It describes an approach that transcends language, technology and process, but still helps us to build better software faster. It's available for pre-order now and viewers of this channel can get a big discount. So do check out the links to that in the description below as well. Twitch had a bad day. Actually, they probably had quite a few, but they found out about them first on October the 6th when a hacker uploaded 125 gigabytes of their data to the internet. The data was clearly a dump from their internal systems and included source code and the financial details of payments made to Twitch's content providers, as well as lots of other stuff. The hacker responsible said that this was just the start and that there was a lot more data to come. Inevitably, Twitch are being careful about what they say. It's a feature of data breaches that they are rarely reported on in detail and sometimes never reported at all. This is for several reasons. First, I suppose it's rather embarrassing for the organisations concerned. Second though, other organisations may be put at risk by publishing the details of a particular breach. And finally, there can be a lot of commercial damage to the company that is the victim of the attack because of loss of trust in their customers. Estimates on the scale of data breaches are really quite frightening. For example, estimates of how likely a company is to suffer a breach range from somewhere between 27.7% to over 90% depending on the source. That is, some sources say, for example, that around 90% of European companies have suffered a breach in the past 12 months. Even the low figure is pretty shocking. Data breaches take a variety of forms, and most lists of common causes contain these. Weak or stolen passwords, malware, backdoors, well-known exploits, and configuration errors. This is a software development channel, so I'm not going to spend too much time on password management. I think that we've probably all learned by now that humans aren't great at thinking of or remembering good passwords. So probably the best to leave it to the computers to look after that. I mostly use Apple devices these days, and Apple seem to be doing a decent job of security as far as I can tell. So I let my devices make up my passwords and remember them for me. The rest of this list, for me at least, falls firmly into continuous delivery territory though. My preferred way to describe continuous delivery is working so that our software is always in a releasable state. If we want our software to be releasable and its security matters, then the security of our system is one of the factors that determines its releasability. So demonstrating the security of our systems needs to be a function of our deployment pipelines and our development process too. The commonest way to describe what I'm talking about here is DevSecOps, which is a horrible term, but it's also an important aspect of our ability to continuously deliver valuable, safe software to our users and customers. 
So how could continuous delivery, or DevSecOps if you really must, have helped Twitch? In software development terms, if we're thinking of external attacks, then the degree to which malware and backdoors matter is really mainly about the provenance of the software that makes up our system. The libraries and infrastructure that our system depends on are part of our production systems too. So we need to understand what's in them, or at least trust where we got them from. If we simply download the latest version of any old open source package or image every time we build or package our software, we're taking a big chance. We're opening the door and not paying attention to who crosses the threshold into the heart of our systems. There are moves to establish trusted repositories that only contain software that has been checked to ensure that it doesn't contain malware, and so software that is known not to be compromised. If you can, can't find or afford that kind of thing, at the very least, I'd keep my own local copy of such libraries. Scan those for common problems and only link to those copies. No direct links to GitHub, Docker Hub, NPM, NuGet or similar for build systems. Common exploits in infrastructure are an important route for external attack. These take the form of a bug or missing feature that allow attackers access to our systems. They take a vast array of different forms, even including bugs in Intel chips, but a common characteristic is that they share a time horizon. It usually takes a while for hackers to find the vulnerability, and then more time for the message to spread in hacker communities. I saw some data at a presentation on the Rugged Manifesto, which describes a more secure approach to looking after our systems. A few years ago, uh, that resonated strongly with me. In it, the presenter said that if you updated your infrastructure so that nothing was more than eight months out of date, that eliminates over 90% of the security vulnerabilities that are commonly used to gain access to or attack our systems. This is another area where continuous delivery helps enormously. When we built our financial exchange at LMAX, we had a definitive deployment pipeline and lots and lots of tests. This meant that we could evaluate any change to our entire production system and get a definitive result on the releaseability in under an hour. That meant that it was cheap to make changes, even infrastructural changes. We used to update the version of Java that we ran on the week after a new release of the language. It took an hour or two to make the change and run all of our tests so that we could release it. Other infrastructure was similarly automated and updated, usually within weeks of any new release. This meant that nothing in our estate was older than a few weeks, and so our systems were less vulnerable to exploit-style attacks. Twitch described their breach as resulting from a configuration change. Though they haven't published any detail of how the change let the attackers in, that brings me on to the next DevSecOps or continuous delivery idea, testing. Did Twitch run security tests as part of their process of releasing change in general? Did they run security tests for configuration changes? My bet on the second one, at least, is that they probably did not. This is still relatively unusual unless you are practicing a fairly sophisticated version of continuous delivery and infrastructure as code. As I said in my recent video on the Facebook outage, no one will think of every vulnerability and imagine every possible test. That's just not humanly possible. An engineering approach, though, is based on learning and discovery. Was this a devastating hole in an otherwise careful approach to security, to be plugged in the light of experience, or was it people not really thinking about security at all? As a software engineer, it's important to imagine how things can go wrong. In security terminology, one version of this is called threat analysis. Did the development teams at Twitch think about how they would try and break into their own system? Did they write tests that explored the exploits that they identified?
Did they think about how to limit access and close down common exploits? Did they employ people to carry out regular penetration testing? A deployment pipeline is an important tool in this kind of approach. In continuous delivery, all change to production flows through the deployment pipeline. This means that configuration changes, as well as code changes, can be evaluated with automated tests. At LMAX, we tested all of the security scenarios that we could think of, and then monitored our regular penetration testing to spot other vulnerabilities that we hadn't thought of. And when we saw something that we hadn't thought of, we added more tests to cover those scenarios. The explanation that Twitch have published so far says very little. A configuration change could mean almost anything, but let's take the normal interpretation. I'd think of a configuration change as usually meaning something that changes the behaviour of our system at runtime. This kind of information is another common cause of vulnerability. The commonest route to leaving the doors open is to stick with the default configuration. Uh, it's surprising how many organisations forget to secure default user accounts and permissions that are supplied to bootstrap installations of their infrastructure. This is a common route for attackers to attempt. But there are other kinds of configuration vulnerability too. Running applications with debug enabled in production is one. Displaying detailed error message, perhaps with stack traces, is another way to leak information that's valuable to attackers. In a good continuous delivery system, every change is tested. At LMAX, our deployment pipeline included, along with lots of other types of tests, a variety of different security tests. We ran behavioural security testing, where we simulated security scenarios from the perspective of users of the system. Could users access the features of the system that they were allowed to? Were users prevented from accessing the features that they weren't? We scanned our software for common vulnerabilities, and we ran analysis of our software and then automated penetration tests against the results that our analysis detected to see if our software was vulnerable in any way. One example of this was uh, we wrote some tests looking for SQL injection attacks. Attackers will sometimes try to compromise your system through its normal inputs, sending data that is much too big to see if they can cause a fault by uh, overloading a buffer, or perhaps sending text that contains SQL instructions embedded within it. Just in case your software passes its inputs directly through to some layer of code lower down that will attempt to store it in a database, and when the code runs, the SQL will do something very nasty to your database. So maybe compromise your software that way. We implemented an automated scan of our UI code. If our analysis detected any input field, our tests then attempted to inject some SQL through it. We read the data coming out of that layer to see if any SQL made it through. None of this is any guarantee that you will find or close all of the holes through which an attacker can gain access to your systems. And a financial system is probably a more obvious target than a game streaming platform, to be honest. But do remember that somewhere between 27.7 and 90% of companies will suffer a breach this year. So maybe this stuff isn't just for people building financial exchanges. Security is important and difficult. It's an arms race between the people who build systems and the people who try to exploit them. The traditional response to problems like this tends to be rather heavyweight and bureaucratic and so slow and inefficient. That doesn't work very well. The other extreme is to ignore security altogether and assume that everything will be okay. That doesn't work very well either. Cybercrime is a vast international business. Industry analysts predict that by 2025, cybercrime will cost the world economy over $10.5 trillion. It's not going away anytime soon. What this means for software development is that we can't afford to leave it only to a few security experts. Like any other attribute of quality in our systems, we need to build security into our systems. That means that the security of our soft software is everybody's responsibility. 
We need to ingrain it in our work and our thinking. And once again, I think that continuous delivery helps us to do this. By moving fast, working experimentally and automating everything, by treating security as part of the releasability of our systems, we achieve better outcomes. We can't ignore our responsibility for the systems that we create. If security matters, and it should unless your software is never connected to the outside world, then there are only two answers. We give up and become so paranoid that we can only move so slowly that we're at risk because we can't respond to new threats, or we find ways of working that are efficient enough to allow us to stay in the fight. The second approach is what I think continuous delivery offers to us. Thank you very much for watching. Thank <laughs> you.